Your commentator is Basil Risedale. Here is the last act in the tremendous drama of the Tunisian theater of war, with the inspired British Eighth Army attacking the Marath Line. Within range of German guns, they paused humbly for divine guidance before coming to grips with the enemy. These are the men who, after being smashed back almost to the gates of Alexandria, have driven the famed Africa Corps into the longest retreat in history. And now they blast them from the Marath line. Tanks and artillery concentrate on the Gobbis Gap. As the British advance westward, prisoners accumulate in ever-increasing numbers until it becomes a problem to organize facilities to get them to the rear and into temporary camps. Gobbis is taken. El Hama falls at the same time. The overjoyed native inhabitants discard hated Nazi badges. Liberty now instead of goose step regulations. General Sir Bernard Montgomery of the victorious 8th Army enters the city through streets lined with cheering crowds. Certainly, here is evidence that the British will be welcomed on the continent when other great days come. On the stocks, the tanks rumble. There's an old-time foreign legionnaire. Meanwhile, the North African commander-in-chief, the American General Dwight D. Eisenhower, is preparing a brilliant strategy. The American Second Corps moves out of the Kasserin Pass and regains ground lost in an earlier setback that came close to disaster. They forge ahead to try and effect a junction with the British Eighth Army. General George Patton, their field commander, watches a clash between the spearheads of his armored divisions and Nazi Mark IVs. Close to the front lines, they watch the action. There's a Nazi dive bomber letting one go. Now American gunners scratch off a Stuka. There's another, on its way to becoming a heap of flaming junk. It is American drive on the flanks of Panarnim's Africa Corps that at last eases the burden of the battling British Eighth Army, which has borne the brunt of the struggle until now. The battery remains of Axis mechanized might an advance guard of Tommies approaches an American scouting force. And then they meet, 15 miles east of El Guatar, a great moment in the drama of North Africa. But Yanks and Tommies are too happy to think of great moments as they make the most of this one in the way that soldiers will when there's a relief from tension. Cigarettes come out and are passed around. They find out quickly that they don't speak exactly the same language but they have a good time exchanging helmets and ribbing each other about Cockney or Simon Pure American speech. Even the Southern boys laugh when they're called Yank and shake on it. General Eisenhower and General Montgomery meet on the battlefield, and it is from this moment on that the coordinated plan for the final offensive is set. American armored divisions suddenly leave the center 
and appear far up on the northern end of the line. Salvos of bombs frustrate every attempt of the Nazis to concentrate reserves and supplies. Allied fighters beat down Axis planes, and flying fields are torn to pieces. The Yanks threaten Matur, and von Arnim is caught with his main forces too far to the east. American artillery finds targets with an accuracy that astounds the Germans. General Anderson, field commander of the Allied forces, meets with General Omar N. Bradley, American field commander. Now the pressure is on. There's the naval station at Bizert, being pounded by American shells. Enemy batteries at the naval station are silenced by American artillery, preparing the way for troops to advance and take the city. Here they come, and the infantry is still queen of battle as it moves in to play the major role. At the city gate, a halt for a moment. Not because there's a speed limit within the city, but because caution rules. Booby traps and snipers are everywhere. And these American boys have learned to be cautious the hard way. It will take a miracle shot to get him. A sniper is located. And that's the end of him. The ruins of Bizert look safe, but these Yanks are taking no chances. The city of Tunis falls almost at the same moment, and advance patrols of the British First Army begin to mop up snipers. It isn't long before the Axis rear guard in the city decides that they don't really want to die for Hitler. From Bizert to the Cap Bon Peninsula, Germans docilely quit cold, even the high-ranking officers. The Nazi General Fritz Krause, Major General Willebald Borowitz, even Colonel General Jürgen von Arnim is flushed out of the mountains near Tunis. The Italian Marshal Giovanni Messi, personifying the mess in Africa for Mussolini. He has the baggage of a globetrotter, but his global activities now will be restricted. Von Arnim gets a car all to himself on the way to a barbed wire enclosed lockup. The last three days of the campaign are fantastic, unbelievable. There is no Dunkirk, no Bataan, no Stalingrad, no desperate effort at evacuation, no last cartridge battle to the end. For the most part, not even dignified surrender. It is collapse, total and unmitigated. The disintegration of an army of more than 200,000 men. When General Anderson's main forces enter Tunis, the people greet them with a demonstration almost hysterical. No victorious army ever met a reception expressing greater joy and relief than these Tunisians. Meanwhile, Bizert is giving the Yanks a welcome. And this is just a foretaste of what will happen on the continent of Europe. An oppressed, long-suffering people giving vent to pent-up emotions. To these liberated thousands, this is the end of Nazi brutalities, Vichy French cowardice, near starvation, forced labor. It is the end of the war for them. General Eisenhower's achievement, a milestone in the march for freedom.